So now we're going to look at the problem of finding the derivative of an inverse function, and we'll see how implicit differentiation can help us do this. So the setup is we're going to suppose f is a one-to-one -one differentiable function, and its inverse is also differentiable. And our goal is, is that pretend we know how to differentiate f. Let's see if we can use that to figure out how to differentiate its inverse function. We're going to use implicit differentiation to actually show this relationship between the derivative of the inverse and the derivative of the function itself. So it's saying that if I want to differentiate the inverse function at x, I just need to take 1 over the derivative of the original function evaluated at f inverse of x. So before we go ahead and prove this using implicit differentiation, let's see why this should be the case. So let's look at an example of this. So here I've got a function sketched in blue. It's the square root function. So the equation describing this curve is y equals the square root of x. And I'm interested in finding the derivative at the point 4 comma 2. What can I do? Well, the idea is, if this is the square root function, then I know it is the inverse of the squaring function. So let's look at the original function, which is the squaring function. The point 4 comma 2 on my square root function corresponds to the point 2 comma 4 on the original function. If you recall that to get the graph of an inverse function from the graph of the original, you just reflect across the line y equals x. So the purple and the blue curve are just reflections of each other across this line y equals x. And so the corresponding points we can see are also reflections of each other. And to get this reflection, you really take anything that's over here, you switch its x and y coordinates, and you get the corresponding object over here. So 4 comma 2 here, you switch the x and y coordinates, you get 2 comma 4 over here. So I'm interested in finding the tangent line at 4 comma 2, or in other words, I'm finding the derivative at 4 comma 2. The thing is, is that I know lots of stuff about the purple curve. This is the squaring function. I could find its derivative there, no problem. The key then is, is the derivative at this point, at the purple point on the squaring function, is that derivative related to the derivative at the corresponding point on the inverse function? So let's have a look. There's the tangent I'm trying to find. There's the tangent I know how to find. Are they related to each other? Well, to see that they're related to each other, let's just pick some point on the tangent line that we're trying to find and look at the corresponding point on the tangent we know how to find. So I pick two points. I'm picking B on the tangent line I want to find and the corresponding point B prime, which you get by reflecting across the line y equals x, is on the tangent line I know how to find. Now I draw a little triangle on the one I know how to find. And what do I know about this triangle? Well, I know that rise, the length of the red line, over run, the length of the orange line, has got to be the derivative at the point there. It's got to be the slope of the tangent line, so it's got to be the derivative at 2. So what that means is the derivative to my original function is red line, length of the red line, over the length of the orange line. Now let's go down to the inverse function. I want to find the derivative at 4 here. And I know that that derivative, its value is the length of the orange line, rise, over the length of the red line. So let's say that again. I want to find orange over red, but I already know how to find red over orange. And so can we see the relationship then? The derivative I'm trying to find is orange over red, and that's just the reciprocal of the derivative I know how to find, which is red over orange. And so that's the key, is that the derivative at this point is the reciprocal of the derivative to the original function at the corresponding point. And so that's what this formula is saying. It's saying if I want to differentiate the inverse function, I look at the reciprocal of the derivative of the original function at the corresponding point. So let's go ahead and jot down this example, just so we have it for reference. So our example is we're looking at the inverse function square root of x, and the original function, which is the squaring function, x squared. And we have that to find the derivative of the inverse function at 4 
we need to find what we need get rid of that need to find the derivative of the original function at 2 and why 2 well just remember that 2 is the point corresponding or the x coordinate of the point corresponding to the point on the inverse curve which had x coordinate 4 so 2 is f inverse of 4 so our picture that we're interested in is we have our square root function, we have our squaring function, we have the point we're trying to find the tangent line at, and the point we already know how to find the tangent line at. And the key thing is, is that to find the slope of this line, it's the reciprocal of the slope of this line. So to find the derivative of the inverse function, it is 1 over the derivative of the original function at 2. So what's the derivative of the original function? Well, it's the x squared function, so its derivative is 2 times x. At particular, In particular, at the x-coordinate 2, it is 1 over 2 times 2, or 1 over 4. And there we go. Now, it's no surprise that the value is a quarter. And we could check this. We already know how to differentiate the square root function. So we're not actually getting anything new here. Uh, aside from the fact that I'm using this as an example to sort of tease out the relationship between a function and its inverse. And then we'll see how to do this in uh, more general in a second. So we can check this. The uh, derivative of the square root function is 1 over 2 root x, and so that means that the derivative of the inverse function f4 is 1 over 2 root 4, or 1 quarter. Right? We already knew that, so no surprise what the value was. But notice in the case that we worked it out here in purple, we worked out the derivative by its relationship to the square function. In our check here, we worked out the derivative from a differentiation rule for the square root of x. So two different methods to work out that same value. Now there's another way we can look at this. So another look at this example. How could we work out the value of the derivative in another way? Well, let's look at the square root function again. y equals square root of x. We're interested in 4 comma 2, and we want to find the tangent line there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, okay, this is just a curve, and I'm looking at a point on the curve. I know how to find derivatives at various points on curves. We've got implicit differentiation, which tells us, you know, you don't need to consider the curve as being the graph of a function. It could be just any old curve, as long as you have an equation for it. So here I'm going to say, well, I've got an equation for my curve, but we could also write the curve as, I could square both sides, and I can get it as y squared is equal to x. And now I could use implicit differentiation. Because if I look at this curve, I can compute the derivative of everything in it, pretending for the moment that I, I, I'm struggling with computing the derivative of the square root function, so instead I switch the problem to looking at an equation that involves the inverse of the square root function, something I know how to differentiate. So now we can use implicit differentiation. So I differentiate with respect to x on the right, or on the left, sorry, and that becomes 2y dy dx. I do the derivative of the right with respect to x, that's 1, and so that becomes then dy dx is equal to 1 over 2y. So there's the derivative at any point on the curve y squared equals x. And so at the point 4, comma 2, the derivative is equal to 1 over twice the y coordinate, 1 over 2 times 2, or 1 over 4. And so there's another way to get the derivative at that point. Okay, so we've seen essentially three different methods now. Now the 
The middle method, which was this check, relied on the fact that we had a differentiation rule already for the square root of x. In general, for inverse functions, we probably don't have a differentiation rule already, and so we're going to try to find one. And that's really the nature of this equation up here that we're trying to verify to begin with. So let's go ahead and verify that this equation relating the derivative of the inverse function to the function itself is true for any function. So let's go ahead and prove this. So let's start with y equals f inverse of x, and we're going to want to find dy dx. So the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, I can rewrite this equation. I can get rid of the inverse by taking f of both sides. So f of the left side, and when I take f of the right side, f of f inverse, they'll cancel each other out and leave me with an x. Now I've got an equation. So if I've got an equation, I can use implicit differentiation here. And so I differentiate the left side, f of y. Well, that's the derivative of the outside function, which is f prime, evaluated at the inside, times the derivative of the inside function, and then to the derivative of the thing on the right, the derivative of x with respect to x, that's just 1. So now I can solve for dy dx. That's what I want to find. That's 1 over f prime of y. And so I can take this expression and write it entirely in terms of x. My original function was in terms of x, so perhaps I should write the derivative in terms of x. So that's 1 over f prime of, well, it's f prime of y, but y is f inverse of x, so I can substitute f inverse of x in for y. And we're done. That's exactly what we wanted to show. That's what we wanted to show up here. And so we've done our proof. Okay, and so we used implicit differentiation to verify this result. Notice this result is written in Newton's notation. If we were to write it in Leibniz notation, it would be dy by dx is equal to, so the derivative of the function is equal to, and we've said this a few times now, is the reciprocal of the derivative of the inverse. So it would be 1 over dx by dy. So this is a way to write it in Leibniz notation, which I think has a pretty, a pretty nice look to it. The derivative of the original function is 1 over the derivative of the inverse. Okay, so now we're just going to go ahead and look at another example. So here we want to find the derivative of arc sine. We want to show that it's 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. So how do we do this? So I don't recommend just trying to commit that previous formula to memory and then jotting it down. Uh, in any given example, what I do suggest is remembering how we derived it. And so what we did was we said, well, I want to find the derivative of arc sine of x. So what I'll do is I'll write y is equal to arc sine of x. And then I'll just rearrange this. I don't know the derivative of arc sine. I do know the derivative of sine, so I'll rewrite the equation as sine of y equals x. Now I will do implicit differentiation. So implicit differentiation. Differentiating the thing on the left, the outside function is sine, its derivative is cosine. The derivative of the ins, oh, so that's evaluated at the inside, times the derivative of the inside. Remember we're differentiating with respect to x here, so that's dy by dx. And then the derivative of what's on the right, its derivative is just 1. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that dy by dx is 1 over cosine of y. So we found the derivative. Uh, but we'd kind of like, since the original function started out in terms of x, we'd like its derivative also to be in terms of x. So we'll write dy by dx in terms of x, so 1 over cosine of, what is y in terms of x? Well, y is arc sine of x. And so there's our derivative. And you may say, well, it doesn't look like 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. And well, the point is, is that we've got something equivalent. So this is the derivative, but it's not in the form that is useful. I mean, if you think about it, if I want to know what the derivative of arc sine is at a third, let's say, well, I can plug a third into this algebraic expression, no problem, and work it out. But taking arc sine of a third and then cosine of that, that seems a little bit more difficult. So 
this algebraic expression for the derivative seems to be a much more usable one. Uh, so let's go ahead and see if we can get it in that form. Well, how can we do that? Well, the idea is to say, well, I'm trying to find the composition of cosine and an inverse trig function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the fact that I know a geometric relationship between sine and cosine. Arc sine of x, well, whatever comes out of that is, can be thought of as an angle. So I'm going to let theta be arc sine of x. Well, that means that sine of theta is x, just rearranging the equation. Ah, so in terms of a picture, if this angle is theta, sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse. So I can think of the hypotenuse as being 1, and therefore the side opposite has to be x, because the ratio's got to be x. So that means that the third leg has got to have value 1 minus x squared. That's the Pythagorean theorem. The sum of the squares of the two legs has to be the square of the hypotenuse. And now I look at this and say, well, I'm really interested in cosine of arc sine of x. Arc sine of x is what I call theta. So I'm really interested in cosine of theta. What's cosine of theta? Well, that's side adjacent over hypotenuse. So cosine of theta is the square root of 1 minus x squared. Ah, there we go. I've got what I wanted. I've expressed cosine of arc sine of x in terms of x in that way. And so we're done. We've got it. So we verified this differentiation rule for the arc sine of x. Now this, I suggest keeping in memory. We've now derived it. You know how to derive it at any given time now if needed. But I do suggest remembering this and remembering the uh, other ones as well for arc cosine, arc tan, and arc cotan. Uh, these ones, go ahead and derive on your own. Make sure you can do them. They're going to proceed in exactly the same way we did here. The only change will be that very last thing at the end where you're going to have some uh, derivative expressed in terms of some trig functions and their inverses, and you're just going to want to try to tease out the relationship between them using a bit of geometry here and get it expressed entirely in terms of x alone in some algebraic way. Now, if, you're, if you want to see an alternate way to do this instead of this last little bit involving geometry, we could do it in an entirely uh, algebraic way, and that is to just look at cosine of sine inverse of x and say, well, the issue is I've got cosine composed with sine inverse. It would be really nice if I had sine composed of sine inverse, because then I'd know they cancel each other off. But I've got cosine and sine inverse. How could I deal with that? Well, I know that cosine is related to sine. So cosine is 1 minus sine squared. And so if this is cosine of this stuff inside, then that's equivalent to the square root of 1 minus sine squared of the same stuff inside. And so now I've got sine composed with sine inverse all squared. Sine composed with sine inverse is x, so this is 1 minus x squared. And so that's another way, that's an algebraic way to do it, straight from the trigonometric identity relating sine and cosine. So either way is uh, fine to do it that way. Just make sure you can do these remaining three as well. All right, so that's it for this example involving derivatives of inverse functions. Now we'll look at some more examples involving implicit differentiation.